I'm not talking tonight. So, Dr. Who, <laughs> you, the, the, the floor is yours. So, all right. your virtual attendees over. are all yours. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm so pleased that everybody could join us today. Um, I'm going to be discussing the genetics of lab in Labrador Retrievers, or what we know about genetics in Labrador Retrievers. Uh, my name is Dr. Angela Hughes, and I'm a veterinarian as well as um, have a PhD is specifically in canine genetics. And I work with the Wisdom Health Team, formerly known as Mars Veterinary. And I did my um, un, um, veterinary work as well as my graduate work in genetics at UC Davis, where I worked closely with Autumn Davidson, who many of you may, may be familiar with. And I shamelessly stole this lovely picture of her dogs um, uh, from several years ago uh, to demonstrate the, the lovely variety that you can get in the Labrador Retriever. So, we're going to start off with a little quiz tonight. Um, have you done any genetic testing in your dogs before, labs or otherwise? Get a sense of, of what the audience has experienced. All right. Wow, we've got a lot of folks that have uh, done some DNA testing, the overwhelming majority, about 70% or so. That's fabulous. Now we're going to take it one step further and ask you what types of genetic testing have you done before in your dogs? And I think you can, you know, select more than one if you've, if you've done several of these. Parentage testing, uh, single mutation testing for a particular disorder or disease, um, panel testing, so testing for several disease markers all at once, trait testing, testing for genetic diversity, uh, breed identification, uh, so if you have um, a mixed breed dog and you want to know its ancestry or sometimes people find out they have a purebred, uh, whether they <laughs> realize it or not, um, some other type of genetic testing, perhaps karyotype testing or something along those lines, or you did some but you're not sure what it was. Give folks a moment to respond. All right. Let's see what we have here. All right, some people have tested for parentage. A lot of folks have tested for a single disorder. Panel testing is, is uh, certainly becoming much more popular, and we'll talk about that in a little bit later. Uh, trait testing, depending on um, your breed and what traits are of interest, that's certainly a possibility. Genetic diversity, a few of you. Um, a few that have tested something else and a couple of you that have also tested but aren't sure exactly what you tested for. So perfect, so we'll hopefully educate you about um, several of these topics and give you a little bit more information. Oh, sorry. Did I? Okay, there we go. <laughs> it did that to me earlier and I wasn't sure what was happening. Anyway, so I just like to kind of start off all of my lectures uh, at the beginning and make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, so basically DNA is the, what I like to call the blueprint for life. Uh, it's the instructions that tell your body how to function and how to construct who and what you are. And those instructions are carried in um, these DNA bases. So A's, C's, T's, and G's. And A's always align with T's, and C's always align with G's. And there are 3 billion of these little letters in the dog genome, and actually in the human genome, and the cat genome, and all that sort of thing. So about 3 billion letters. And all of that information is condensed down into these chromosomes that are contained within the nucleus of the cell. Uh, and so we can get DNA out of any nucleated cell. So in a blood sample, if we were to take a blood sample to collect a DNA um, uh, sample from your dog, we'd be looking for those white blood cells that carry a nucleus in the DNA, where the red blood cells in mammals typically are not nucleated. So the red blood cells we honestly just kind of discard. They aren't very helpful. Uh, if we're doing a cheek swab, we can collect that, uh, those cells off the cheek and the gums to collect the DNA from those uh, nucleated cells. We can also collect it from a tissue sample. Um, sometimes if a dog has passed away, folks will use a tissue sample, or more commonly in the breeding world, they'll use a semen sample to collect DNA from a, a deceased dog if they've got uh, semen stored. Uh, now within that three billion letter you know, soup, so to speak, of what is the dog genome, there is what I like to call kind of a sentence or phrase that you can pick out and this represents to me the gene. So in, like I said, out of 3 billion bases, within that there's about 20,000 genes. Uh, and it only takes about 20,000 genes to create a dog or a human or a cat. 
uh, which I just find kind of mind-boggling. It doesn't really take all that much information. Uh, so then there's a lot of DNA outside of those genes that it may be regulatory or honestly just be there and not do a whole lot. Um, so we can then query those bases, those, those letters, and find out what changes have been made, and that's how we find um, uh, different mutations. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. So I love this, this picture because it captures in, a, in one picture quite a lot of information. So the Chihuahua to the Great Dane, more than 99% of their DNA is exactly the same. In fact, the dog, to my knowledge, is the most genetically diverse species on the planet with uh, over 400 different breeds recognized globally. Um, and as you can see, a wealth of variation by breed, be it behaviorally, structurally, um, uh, morphologically, et cetera. And that means it's a wealth of information for geneticists and one of the reasons why we so enjoy studying, uh, studying these individuals. And in fact, I like to tell the story that we once had a client call us up and tell us about how they did have, in fact, a Chihuahua Great Dane litter. Um, I guess the Great Dane had gone in for a dental with the veterinarian and, and came home and was still a little, you know, sleepy, groggy. Uh, but she was also in heat. And so the little intact male Chihuahua in the household decided to take advantage of the situation. And 63 days later, they had Chihuahua Great Dane puppies. <laughs> Um, that are fertile offspring. That's the amazing thing, that the, the dog is just, you know, really a, a mind-boggling species to me. But how do we get all of this diversity, everything from this Chihuahua to this Great Dane to the Labrador Retriever in between? We get it through um, something called alleles. And alleles are created by DNA mutations or, or changes in the DNA. And if we look at that uh, top strand, the normal strand of the DNA, uh, that's kind of what we call the wild type or normal. That's what's supposed to be there in theory. Uh, but we can have changes in the DNA. So we can have a single base change. So in this case, the A was changed to a C. We can have an addition. So we had a couple of Gs put into, um, uh, into the DNA. Or we can have a deletion where the A and the T were removed. Any of those has the potential to alter the DNA um, such that A, we can query it, we can look for it, we can find that change but also B, we can sometimes see alterations at the protein level. And we'll talk about that next. So alleles, as I mentioned, are alterations at the sequence level and the DNA level. And if they're in the right place in the DNA, or right, right cell in the body, um, they can be passed on to future generations. So if you have a mutation occur that affects a lung cell, that's not going to be passed on to the puppies. But if you have one in the stem cells that then uh, progress to become eggs or sperm, uh, those can be passed on to future generations. And as I mentioned, some changes in the DNA, some alleles can uh, become differences in the proteins that result in, say, a structural change, a leg length difference or a coat color difference or a disease difference, so a predisposition to diabetes or cancer or something else. And a breed of dogs tends to carry a lot of the same alleles. I, I like to say that it, purebred dog breeders have a very, you know, honestly limited toolbox. To create a Labrador, you have to have uh, a dog of a certain, you know, size and conformation and coat color and, you know, drop ear and all that sort of thing. Labrador, you know, wide base tail. Um, and if you get too far afield from that, it's not going to be called a Labrador. Uh, and you also have expectations um, behaviorally of what they're going to act like and, and be able to do performance life. Now, in the mixed breed world, you know, depending on what toolboxes get mixed together, all bets are off. You can have a combination that looks very much like a Labrador yet has no Labrador in its ancestry, or you can have a combination um, uh, of tools that looks like nothing you've ever seen before, quite honestly. I've seen a few of those really unusual looking dogs. Um, uh, but, but really, it's, it's, the alleles are what makes a breed a breed. Um, and, and what are the important things within that breed to, say, a Labrador versus a Great Dane? And that's what we want to preserve. We want to preserve those pre breed defining characteristics that make Labradors what we love while working against the things that uh, could potentially cause problems. So 
to make sure we're all kind of on the same page, and because it's a Labrador talk, I thought I would talk about um, Labrador coat colors. Uh, so we're going to look at two alleles at the same gene. That gene is TYRP1, our tyrosinase-related protein 1, and um, it comes in kind of two flavors. Big B, which is black, and the dominant allele, because it's capital, uh, and then chocolate or brown, little b, uh, which is the recessive allele. And to look at this and uh, understand it a little bit more, we're going to start by looking at the pigment production pathway. And the pigment production pathway starts with tyrosine, which is a colorless amino acid right here. And it goes through this first step through tyrosinase to become dopoquinone. Now, if we were to block tyrosinase production, I usually quiz the vet students at this point, what would happen? Well, we would end up with a dog that doesn't produce any pigment because I uh, can't get past that first step in the pigment production pathway. And so you don't get any pigment formation in the coat or the nose or the irons or the pads on the, pads on the feet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these dogs, while there is some potential health-related concerns, such as um, uh, potential increased risk of cancer because they get more UV radiation than the average dog since they don't have the pigment to filter that out at all, uh, they also can have certain things like uh, what we call photophobia, where they are more sensitive to bright lights and the sun and such like that because they don't have uh, the pigment in their, in their iris and their eye to help protect them from, from those bright lights. Other than that, really, they are fairly healthy. Um, uh, but some, you know, some breeds choose to breed for it and some against it, that sort of thing. Uh, but needless to say, that's what happens if you block that first step at tyrosinase or one of the um, small number, three or four other related um, genes that are involved in that, in that first step. And as it turns out, they just found a couple of years ago the mutation responsible in Dobermans, and it turned out it wasn't in tyrosinase, it was in one of the other um, uh, related uh, proteins at that step. But needless to say, any of those being blocked would, would cause a problem in, in an albino animal. Now, if you could move through the pathway, you can get down to the phenomelanin, which is the yellow or red color that we see in, in Labradors. Um, like on the red spectrum, it can be more like an iris center, that sort of thing. Or we can go up the eumelanin pathway uh, to a black pigment, uh, and that's how we get the black coat color. Now, if we were to block this protein right here, this TYRP1, we get stuck at what's called 5,6-dihydroxyindole, uh, which is a brown color, uh, and that reads brown to our eyes, and that's how we get the chocolate dog. Now, they've found several different mutations in TYRP1. Um, just recently, they found a fourth. So we have four known mutations in this one gene, and if a dog inherits any two of them uh, in any combination, they cannot produce uh, a functional TYRP1, and therefore they're going to have a brown, brown coat or uh, produce only brown eumelanin rather than black. And so I'm very careful when I talk about eumelanin in relation to calling it the dark pigment rather than the black pigment, because you know, obviously in cases it can be brown rather than black. Now, um, the yellow Labrador puppies um, are the result of an additional mutation uh, called, uh, in a gene called MC1R. Uh, this is traditionally called extension, or E, uh, in, the, in the genetics field, uh, because it extends the melanin through the, the entire shaft of the hair. And again, I like to quiz the vet students as to whether they can determine if the yellow lab puppies have a functional TYRP1 uh, allele um, and why we know they do. And I won't belabor it with you guys because I'm sure you know, uh, but looking at their nose, their eye rims, the pads on their feet, that sort of thing, you can tell if they carry at least one functional copy of TYRP1 to be able to make black pigment uh, rather than brown. So if we go to the next slide, we can see here uh, the different possible combinations of uh, Labrador coat colors. So for a black Labrador, they have uh, at least one normal copy of that extension allele so that they can produce the dark pigment in their coat. Uh, and then they have at least one copy of the uh, big B allele, uh, the black allele, to give them a black coat. A chocolate dog, again, needs one copy of extension and then two um, uh, non-functional copies of TYRP1. 
And finally, a yellow Labrador has two broken copies of extension of that MC1R, so they're little e, little e, and then something is the TYRC1. Um, so what we've got here some examples of the uh, black pigment, obviously gives us the normal black nose and that sort of thing, where little b, little b would give us um, uh, the, the brown or pink nose. Um, and while it's in the show ring, uh, typically a fault to have that, that brown nose, uh, we are seeing it more, on a yellow background. We are seeing it more commonly, uh, particularly in the field lines, where they seem to be less concerned with the appearance of the dog and more concerned about the performance, obviously, uh, and the ability of the dog to go and retrieve the bird and, and come back in a, in a very timely manner. So we are seeing it, you know, from a traits perspective, becoming a little bit more common to see the, the little b, little b, little e, little e combination. But you may, you may or may not see that in your world. All righty. So that's Labrador coat colors in a, in a quick nutshell. Hopefully that was largely review for folks. Uh, but just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page about alleles and, and mutations and the DNA. Now I'm going to kind of shift gears a little bit and, and talk a little bit about endangered species. So um, almost a decade ago, about uh, eight or nine years ago, um, I was working with the Mars veterinary team back then, and we were you know, developing better and better tests to understand the ancestry of mixed breed dogs. And we really hit on the idea of we're doing so much to better understand mixed breed dogs, but what can we do to leverage our genetics and what we know about dogs to help purebred uh, animals? And so when I was tasked with this um, uh, problem or question, I looked at it as, um, you know, kind of reformatted it because I, in my previous life, had been thinking about going into more of an endangered species genetics type role and thinking about how to preserve um, our endangered species, work with species survival plans and such like that to help them identify which animals should be bred together to maintain the genetic diversity within that population. And so I really started thinking of it through that lens. Uh, how can we apply those techniques to uh, our dogs to, to help them? Um, so <clears throat> just a little bit of information and background around genetic diversity. Genetic diversity is really the variability of the genes within a population. And it can have an impact on the population's health and long-term survival because we know that decreases in genetic diversity are associated with um, uh, reduced fitness of the population. So it's important to keep in mind that only the genetic variants that are passed on to the next generation can affect future diversity, and that's where we can run into some, some issues. And Labradors are going to be a little bit of a caveat to my idea of treating uh, mixed breed, or excuse me, purebred dogs as endangered species because in many ways you actually have a lot more diversity than the average purebred population, which is great. But what we need to do is think about it in terms of how to preserve that diversity that you have and maintain it um, because you can rapidly lose it um, through uh, potentially the risk of infectious diseases or um, geographic ba barriers and boundaries. We've actually seen that um, by virtue of the UK Labradors actually have a slightly different genetic signature than what we see in the US populations. And we also see it uh, in terms of uh, field lines versus show lines. There's also genetic, slight genetic differences in their uh, signatures. So depending on how the dogs are chosen for breeding uh, due to, like I said, geographical influences or uh, breeder preference, we can see bottlenecks occurring even within a, a larger population where there is a fair amount of genetic diversity. Um, and then, as, again, as you breed into a single line, that's another area where a genetic bottleneck can occur, and so we want to pay close attention to that. Uh, genetic diversity is constantly changing from generation to generation. It's important to recognize that you can take a snapshot today and go, oh, okay, our genetic diversity is great, but a couple generations from now, that could shift quite a bit. Like I said before, is you know, one or two generations if you have a, a strong enough bottleneck, you can have a significant shift in your genetic diversity. So it's important to keep monitoring it through, through many generations or through time. And it's really easy to lose. You can lose it in one or two generations a lot. Um, and it's potentially difficult to regain. So it's 
you know, there's, there's a couple different ways to regain it. You can maintain your existing diversity and then just allow for new mutations and, and diversity to kind of get baked in over time because new mutations are going to naturally occur uh, over generations. Uh, it's, you know, a way to preserve your purity, but it's going to be a very slow way to regain diversity. If you want to regain diversity quickly, you can outcross to another breed, um, but obviously there's consequences. Um, an example I was thinking of in the last lecture relates to, um, uh, say, the wolf and, and coyote populations, at least what we're seeing in, in the U.S. and I think probably Canada as well, is that uh, there aren't enough individuals to mate within the wolf population, so they're starting to outcross to the coyote population and creating this wolf-coyote hybrid. Uh, so by virtue of um, population and probably territory problems and such like that, they're having to outcross to another breed, which is introducing a lot of genetic diversity really fast, but you're no longer a wolf or a coyote. You're a wolf-coyote hybrid. Um, so something to keep in mind, we can do it with the dog populations, but again, that's a pretty radical idea and one most breeds want to try to avoid. So what I am you know, really pushing is let's maintain the genetic diversity that we have within the Labrador population by monitoring it and being mindful of it and making breeding decisions as we move forward with that in mind so we don't end up with a problem in the future. Um, again, just to kind of understand how genetic diversity is, is calculated and such like that, we have a couple of examples here. We have identical by descent and identical by state. So in this uh, example, uh, identical by descent is when two alleles um, are identical because they came from the same, same ancestor. So um, in that case, this little b, little b is representative of uh, mutation or of, of the DNA and mutations that the dog carries. Uh, along a greater swath of its, of its genetic material uh, is probably overlapping because it has that similar ancestor in its background. Uh, alternatively, we have identical by state where two different animals happen to look like they probably are the same. So we have the little b prime, little b prime, and the little b, little b. So if we were to breed these two dogs together, we'd end up with a little b, little b prime. And while this dog would look very similar to this dog, it would actually, in fact, be um, probably a lot more genetically diverse because it doesn't have the overlap of the um, uh, ancestral um, allele elsewhere. And we'll kind of come back to that a little bit later when we talk about inbreeding coefficients. All right. So now that we've covered a little bit about genetic diversity, are you concerned about genetic diversity within your specific breeding line? Yes, no, or not sure. Give folks just a minute to, to respond. All right. So a little over half of you are, are concerned about genetic diversity. Um, about a quarter of you aren't. Uh, you feel that you're probably okay. And about 20% of you aren't sure. And that mimics very similar to what we saw earlier today with that group as well. Uh, so certainly uh, an area of, of interest and concern. So that's great. We can cover it. So again, back to my concept of the purebred dog being an endangered species. Um, uh, again, if you, if you break it down by breed, um, and like I said, the Labrador is a little bit of an outlier with regard to this theory, and I will be the first person to admit that, but there definitely are a lot of breeds that are in a lot worse shape than you are, um, but we don't want to see the Labradors slide into that as well. Um, the interesting thing is, I'll talk a bit more about the Dandy Dinmont Terrier in a little bit, but one of the things that I hadn't really thought about or expected when I went into developing the idea of genetic diversity and, and using that as a tool for breeders um, is that there's also, in addition to the dogs, there's, there's social concerns. Um, the Dandy Dinmont Terrier, quite honestly, has its genetic diversity issues and has its health issues that they're working on, but it also has an issue with recruiting breeders. And the average breeder uh, in that population is probably in their late 50s or early 60s, 
and they just aren't seeing an influx of, of new young breeders. So I'm honestly very worried that that breed's going to die out more from lack of interest than, than genetic or health concerns. Uh, so that's something else that, that we need to actively work on is, is uh, encouraging people to, to get into these, these breeds and, and help them um, carry on beyond our current generations. But that being said, um, the Pumis, the Norwich Terriers, even the Golden Retrievers have um, genetic diversity concerns um, and have a fairly small population considering even you know, what, they've, what they have available to them. But I don't think you guys would be surprised to know that they have genetic diversity concerns. So inbreeding. There are certainly pros of inbreeding, and there's also cons. So the pro is that you can select for uh, characteristics that you like, and you can make sure that your offspring have them by fixing those desired traits. So um, when we say fix in a genetic sense, it means everybody carries it. So uh, for example, all Labradors have drop ears. That is fixed in the population. You will never see a Labrador with prick ears. Um, the, uh, and you'll get a very consistent output in your, in your puppies. The cons are um, that it can have, inbreeding can have a negative effect on litter size, and it can also increase stillbirths, as seen in several different studies. Uh, it can increase the predisposition to genetic disease, which shouldn't surprise any of us. Uh, if a lot of your DNA is overlapping and inherited from common ancestors, it's very likely that you're um, going to get two deleterious or disease alleles uh, that could combine to create a uh, uh, genetic problem. Interestingly enough, there was a German study looking at hunting ability in a few different German um, hunting breeds, and they found decreased hunting ability as the genetic diversity went down. Um, so that's, that's something to pay attention to from a um, performance standpoint. And finally, uh, an, another study in Bernese Mountain Dogs found a decrease in the lifespan of the dogs as their uh, genetic diversity went down as well. Uh, so something else to keep in mind. Um, when we, when we look at you know, overly inbred populations and, and why we might want to avoid them. Now, how have we measured, you know, this isn't, you know, genetic diversity isn't something we just thought of as a problem 10 years ago. It's something that breeders have thought about and been concerned about for a while. What have we used to measure it? We've used uh, inbreeding coefficient or coefficient of inbreeding. Uh, and that is basically the probability that two alleles at a particular point in the DNA chosen at random from two individuals are identical by descent. So that, uh, as we talked about in our example uh, earlier, that it's you know, two little b's or two little b primes versus a little b prime little b. Um, and so it's a calculation. And in inbreeding, as we discussed previously, involves a preferential mating between close relatives. And that can have an impact by reducing the fitness. So some of the limitations. So that's you know that's what we had at the time. That's great. We you know that gets us so far. But there are limitations of inbreeding coefficients. One is that it's a calculation for the litter based on a sire and a dam, uh, and their pedigrees. And so it's an average for that litter. It does not tell you specifically what each individual managed to inherit from their mom or their or their, or their dad. Uh, so each puppy really should have its own calculation and and information because. The overlap in the genetic material each of them inherits is only, on average, about 25%. Now, we also have to worry about pedigree errors. So studies in humans and dogs alike have uh, found that about 10% of um, pedigrees have an error in them by you know, accident or on purpose or what have you. But needless to say, that's going to change your calculations if you have a, a different dog in one of those positions. And finally, we tend to underestimate the coefficient of inbreeding because we uh, assume that the founder generation, so however many generations you go back, whatever that founder generation is, we say those are all completely independent uh, individuals that have no genetic overlap and you know, therefore aren't going to contribute some of the same information. And as we all know, that's probably not the case. Now to reinforce this, I have a graph here uh, that was put together by um, a geneticist named Claire Wade for one of her Nova Scotia duck tolling retrievers named Byrne. And she calculated the COI 
going back over many, many generations. And her point is, you know, oftentimes we cut off a COI at about um, five generations, in which case this dog is looking pretty darn good. Um, but when we have the data, we should carry it out further, and we find out that he's actually more in the 28 range rather than the 3.2 range. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. And just again, another way of representing that graphically is this is what an inbreeding coefficient calculation looks like is, you know, four independent individuals in this founder generation, uh, and they're equally contributing to each generation subsequently. So you end up with, you know, 25% of each of those founder generations uh, that in that founder generation here in the, in the final dog uh, by calculation. However, in genetic reality, we tend to have, you know, dogs overlapping in what they, what they have available uh, in that founder generation, and then the amount that gets passed down is going to be somewhat random, and your final dog isn't going to be a quarter of each of those. It's going to be some amalgamation and, and uh, uh, such of, of each of the contributor, contributing you know, signatures, so to speak. And like I said, what the puppy, next puppy, the next offspring happens to inherit could vastly differ from what this dog got. So each dog really deserves its own individual calculation. Now, measuring genetic diversity with DNA gets us away from some of those constraints. We don't have to worry about pedigree correctness because we're measuring what this individual dog has. We don't have to worry about the average for the litter because we are testing, again, what this dog presently has and therefore can contribute to the next generation. Um, and uh, you know, we don't have to worry about that founder effect either. Again, we're only looking at what the dog has right now. Um, we can also compare uh, the individual within the population uh, by looking at either you know, heterozygosity or homozygosity. And these are two big words that are basically complementary. Uh, heterozygosity is the number per, per, uh, percentage of their markers that they inherited different things from their mother and their father, where homozygosity is the number of markers where they inherited the same thing. Uh, so like I said, they're, they're just complementary ways of measuring um, diversity. And I'll use them kind of interchangeably as we go forward, and I'll try to be clear as to which one I'm talking about. Um, but needless to say, in this graph, um, I show the Labrador retriever population uh, that we've tested as of that of this date. This is a few years ago now, but needless to say, uh, and then the one individual is represented by the circle. Uh, so you can see where one dog lies on the graph of all of Labradors, and in relation in this case to all of the other retrievers that we've tested as well. So the retrievers include the curly coat, the soft coat, the uh, excuse me, curly coat, the flat coat, uh, the golden retriever, Labrador retriever, and the Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever. And then orange is all dogs tested, so pure, mixed, or otherwise. And um, so you can see um, the Labradors, in comparison to the Retrievers, are actually on the more diverse end, which is great. Um, we still have a tail, though, that, that's getting towards the less diverse end. So that's something we need to be aware of uh, and continue to work to stay uh, more to the right of this graph rather than moving to the left. Now, I was going to actually take out the, the graph of the golden retrievers since we were talking about Labrador retrievers uh, today, but I realized that uh, this graph actually shows a really great feature, and so I did want to keep it in to show this to you. This is all of the golden retrievers tested versus um, uh, all dogs uh, in orange again. Uh, but what you see here is that we have the, the curve for the golden retrievers, but we also get this little hump on the end. And that hump actually of, of increased diversity represents the working dog population um, that had been tested. So you can see, again, in the working dog population, they're um, doing pretty well for themselves and, and aiming for a little bit more genetic diversity, which is fabulous, um, over, say, the show population or, or general uh, golden retriever population. So it's, it's very possible to, to move that, that curve uh, if you give it some attention. Um, now, this is a very, very busy slide, um, but it gives homozygosity, so again, the opposite of heterozygosity, uh, within the breed uh, across nearly 200 breeds. So not every breed is, is noted at the bottom. So if you don't see your breed, um, uh, it's not that it wasn't there necessarily. It's just it couldn't quite make it onto the slide uh, in terms of wording. Uh, 
Uh, but I have pointed out a couple of things. One is the U.S. field line uh, population for Labrador retrievers, and they tend to be at our more diverse end of our population. Uh, the U.S. show line of Labradors is a little bit further to the uh, left, showing that they're a little bit uh, less diverse than the field line. Again, not terribly surprising considering uh, what's going on there. In comparison, you might notice uh, so we've got the UK golden retriever population is right here, and they are quite a bit less diverse. In fact, they're getting lines of the American Water Spaniel, Whippet, uh, Black and Tan Coonhound, Phelium Terrier, that sort of thing. Um, so they have a, a fair bit less diversity than what we see in the, in the Labrador populations. We also have a UK show Labrador population, and I'm sorry, that's not represented exactly on the slide, so I can't tell you exactly where they fall. Uh, their name isn't here, so I can't, I can't point them out. But this is just to give you some idea. And you can see here on the, on the right-hand side, the more diverse we've got, not only the field Labradors, we've got the Parson Russell Terrier, the Anatolian Shepherd. So again, dogs that tend to be more performance um, uh, bred, uh, less confirmationally bred, uh, so they tend to have a little bit more diversity. Um, where at the other end we have the Sussex Spaniel, the Irish Terrier, the Clumber Spaniel, Fox, uh, Wire Fox Terrier, that sort of thing, Scottish Terriers. Uh, so those breeds that are, are really quite small and very limited in their diversity. Um, another one that was down here was the uh, Norwegian Linda Hunt. I think that is the most inbred <laughs> population that we've seen, which again, if you know anything about how the breed was reconstructed, that won't surprise you. Um, they have very little genetic diversity. Now, moving on, um, the again, the, the benefits of measuring genetic diversity with DNA is that we can continue to, we can monitor the changes in genetic diversity over generations. So as I mentioned, we want to move away from just doing a single snapshot uh, every once in a while and going, oh, okay, we're good, or oh, no, we're about to fall off a cliff, and uh, move towards monitoring it generation after generation so we can keep closer tabs on it and move in the right direction uh, through a more measured and controlled means. We can also then use that DNA uh, to identify mates that are, would be optimal in increasing the genetic diversity in our offspring. So uh, by testing you know, a, a handful of dogs, you can then look at them in comparison to each other and say, okay, based on not only um, disease mutation uh, concerns, so if one of them is a carrier for EIC, we want to look for non-carrier to mate, uh, mate them with, uh, but we can also then look at the diversity information and find compatible uh, dogs to breed so that we can continue with uh, genetic diversity as well. Um, all right. We have the ability then to also visualize the genetic relationships and population substructure that might come up in the breed. So this is an image uh, from our website that I took out just yesterday. So this is a snapshot almost in real time of all of the dogs, all the Labradors we have presently in the database and which countries they are uh, representing. So I did note that Canada uh, was not, not well, <laughs> well noted in the database yet. Hopefully that will change. Um, but needless to say, you can see that uh, the U.S. Labradors uh, kind of are falling off to the, the lower right corner where the Finnish Labradors, because our partner Genoscoper is in Finland, they've tested a lot of Finnish dogs, uh, is kind of arcing up and to the right. So we are seeing some substructure within uh, the Labrador population um, as well. And so that's something to keep in mind that if you aren't finding a great genetic match um, close to home, you might start looking a little bit further afield and you can look to out, quote unquote, outcross to say a Finnish dog, um, Finnish Labrador, and get uh, a lot of genetic diversity through that means. Um, and, and we can maintain the diversity within the population globally uh, as opposed to you know, getting up to a point where you then start thinking about an outcross to some other breed or not. I think that's a long ways off. But needless to say, there's a lot of diversity out there uh, within the breed. We just need to capture it and, and leverage it and, and provide that to you. You also have the ability to um, color the dogs by tags, and the tags are, you know, is it a companion dog, is it a confirmation dog, is it a, a field dog or, or a working dog, that sort of thing. And so you can see the breakdown by, by what uh, folks have tagged their dogs as well. So you can see if there's some substructure based on use of the dog and that sort of thing. 
and I won't belabor this too much um, because this is chock full of information, but this is the genetic relationships across the retrievers. Uh, so the Labradors are in yellow in the center, and then uh, you've got your flat coats and your chesties and all that sort of thing, uh, and how they all compare together, and you can move it around and zoom in and zoom out. Um, but basically what this chart is showing you is the genetic relationship between the retrievers. And I find it interesting that uh, the flat-coated retriever is actually the closest retriever to the Labrador, uh, and then the Chesapeake, and then the Golden, and then the Toller, and finally the curly-coated retriever, um, although those are getting pretty close in their, in their numbers there. And so you can see that breakdown for all of them. And I did want to point out, if you go looking at um, the Optimal Selection website or, or my dog DNA website, uh, there is this extra group of golden Labrador retrievers, uh, and that's a special, unique population belonging to one of the um, guide dog groups. Uh, so you can honestly ignore them. They are summer lab, summer golden, summer lab golden crosses, and it's all for them. So uh, that's for them to be able to visualize their dogs. So uh, as I mentioned, I did do a study in the Dandy Dinmont Terrier um, back in about 2009, 2010. We started it uh, because we had this idea of using genetic diversity to help the dogs. And we said, OK, we want to see if that actually applies in practice. So um, we set out with the goals of collecting DNA samples from the breeding dandies. And we ultimately gathered over 250 um, dandies, which I think at the time was almost the entire population of the U.S., plus a few dogs from around the world. We analyzed the breed for their diversity levels, and then we used that um, data to then create our uh, matching tool, essentially, our comparison of sires and dams uh, to create the, the potential breeding partners. And the, the Danny Dan Mont Terrier Club was hugely helpful, and I, I thank them immensely for their help with this. And just to kind of, in short and in brief, give you a few of the results that we took away from it, uh, we did show that we were able to increase the litter size. Uh, so we came out with about 3.75 puppies per litter uh, compared with their litter uh, average that was registered in 2010 of 2.11. So that was a huge improvement. Um, we were able to show that the diversity of the puppies was actually uh, on average higher than the diversity of their parents. So we did achieve increasing the diversity within that, gen that a single generation even. Um, we did see a potential link between a, a decrease uh, in homozygosity, so an increase in diversity, and an improvement in post boss human motility, and I'll show you some of that in a moment. And we were still producing AKC champions. So even though they were starting to use genetic diversity as one of the criteria in their mate selection process, uh, it didn't mean that we watered down the dog or, or weren't, were producing ugly dogs. They were producing some of the best dogs that some of these breeders had done in their entire life. And uh, Abigail here is a, a dog that um, they produced in the first litter that we used genetic diversity in selecting the mates. And she went on to um, the UK to become a breeding bitch. Um, another dog, Wesley, went on to Cruff and to um, Westminster, and the breeder just had a blast showing him because she was just so enthralled with him. He was a wonderful dog, and still is. He's still around. <laughs> but needless to say, um, this is a graph looking at uh, the puppies per litter versus the breeding score, and this was some initial data that I got that really got me excited. And as you can see down here, um, we have lower diversity here on the uh, lower predicted diversity on the right, uh, higher predicted diversity on the left in the litter, and then the number of puppies per litter on the y-axis. And what I found really interesting is that we saw kind of this step change. As we increased the diversity, the predicted diversity, we saw increases in the litter sizes, all the way up to six puppies per litter in several litters, which was almost unheard of in the breed. Uh, their historic average was right about two and three quarters. Like I said, in 2010, it was just a little over two dogs per litter. We did have a couple of you know, outliers down here at the bottom, and when we looked a little bit closer uh, as to how the dogs were mated, that seems to be playing a role as well, um, which again, should not shock anybody. <laughs> um, natural matings, if you can do them, certainly are, are most likely to be successful with um, uh, greater numbers of puppies. But we even got some uh, really good results with um, 
uh, chilled and some frozen, uh, but we also are, are kind of outliers down at the bottom tended to be frozen semen as well. Um, so something to keep in mind is uh, uh, if you're trying to increase your, your litter output, obviously, is, is uh, using as close to natural as you can or a really good practitioner who can uh, handle their frozen semen well. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, we looked at just seven dogs. So we didn't have a ton of dogs, um, but we had data on uh, their homozygosity level, so their level of diversity within each of the males, and also their um, parameters on uh, semen thaw. And um, what we found was, uh, in particular, um, post-thaw motility uh, seemed to be correlated with the diversity level. So this is the um, low diversity dogs down here uh, on the right and high diversity dogs on the left. And so we see a really strong trend uh, with uh, diversity uh, and post-thaw semen motility. We did again have one outlier down here. That was a seven month old male. Uh, and that was his first collection. And when they collected him again, he was up here. So um, probably just a, a one-off. But uh, certainly something to consider following up on and something that we've seen uh, in other species that diversity does seem to impact um, uh, semen parameters. Now, with genetic disease testing, it's important to keep in mind that there is really no perfect dog. Uh, it's been projected that the average human carries somewhere between 50 and 100 known disease mutations and an additional 250 to 300 loss of function mutations, so things that may actually impact us. We just haven't fully characterized them yet. Um, so I like to emphasize that um, just because a, a dog is positive for one copy of a genetic mutation doesn't mean that he should be completely removed from the breeding population. If we go back and think about that you know, genetic bottleneck thing, that would be a way to create a genetic bottleneck by throwing out anybody who's a carrier um, or, or may, carry, uh, may have a, a genetic mutation. We just need to use genetic uh, testing and DNA testing to clarify the appropriate mate to mate that dog with, such that we don't produce affected offspring, uh, but can carry all of their good genes and, and diversity forward. Now, this um, chart here actually is just slightly out of date because um, what I'm going to show you momentarily, uh, we actually have 13 different um, mutations that we can test for in the Labrador Retriever at this point in time. But as you can see, there's several breeds where there's you know, at least five or more genetic mutations uh, that they can test for presently. And there's many more that we still need to find, but, but this is a great start. And as I mentioned, um, we are finding more and more genetic mutations over time. And as we do, and therefore go look for those mutations, more and more individuals are going to come up as positive for one or more of them. So again, we don't want to say only the perfect dog can be bred because quite honestly, if we look hard enough, every dog is going to carry a mutation of some sort. Um, now the spread of genetic disorders uh, is kind of interesting. So we all know that the dog came off of the wolf uh, and different mutations likely arose at different times uh, in that process of breed development. So degenerative myelopathy is present across many breeds uh, and therefore probably uh, mutated very early on uh, and therefore spread across a lot of breeds. Exercise-induced collapse is found in a, in a number of breeds. So again, it was probably a little bit of an earlier mutation. Uh, Central nuclear myopathy, however, seems to be largely, at least as far as we know at this point, confined to the Labradors. Uh, so that seems to be a Labrador-specific uh, mutation and therefore probably developed after breed formation. So something to keep in mind. Um, genetic disease testing. Uh, we've moved now from the older technology where you had to individually uh, identify mutations and, and test for a single mutation at a time to now where we can create panels of mutations and we can test. Uh, our current panel has almost 200 different disease and trait mutations that we can test with one single DNA sample, which makes it really easy, convenient, um, uh, and cost effective for, for uh, screening dogs for these mutations. And the other nice thing is that using DNA, we can test dogs basically at any age. As soon as a puppy can be held off the dam for about two hours, you can cheek swab that dog because we want to eliminate the, 
possibility of contamination of the dam's DNA in the, in the puppy's mouth. Um, but once you can achieve that, you can test those puppies very easily with a cheek swab. You can also test them with a blood sample basically at any age, but I don't know too many people that want to go poking, uh, poking really young puppies, um, but something to keep in mind. And that way you can screen them before placing them in homes or, uh, and, and figure out which dogs to keep into your breeding program or which dogs uh, can go to other folks who will be breeding, that sort of thing. Now, um, we did create, so we have a, a fair bit of data on these, you know, almost uh, 200 disease mutations at this point uh, and by breed. And so we've created a website called mybreeddata.com uh, with the um, known disorders uh, relevant to each breed. So if you look up Labrador Retrievers, there are 13 disorders that are listed. Uh, one of them uh, is in particular is new, Alexander disease, which is a neuromuscular disorder uh, that was recently described in Labrador. So we've added that to our panel. Uh, but we have several others that you've probably heard of, like central nuclear myopathy. Again, it's still got uh, about a 4% carrier rate and a little over 1% genetically at risk. So that's homozygous um, uh, rate. So that's one to keep an eye on and, and continue testing for and, and making sure that doesn't come up. Um, EIC, exercise-induced collapse, is another one. We have uh, a little over 26% carrier rate and a near, uh, over 4% at risk rate. Um, this one is certainly one that we need to pay close attention to and, and work to move away from. Uh, but on the other hand, we don't want, you know, we don't have to say all dogs that are carriers should be tossed out of the breeding program because we can test for it. We can monitor that and measure that and keep track of it. Um, another one um, is progressive retinal atrophy. So again, this I think is an excellent example of where proper breeding has interceded. So even though we still have an almost 17% carrier rate, we have a less than 1% genetically at risk rate. So people are testing for PRCD and they're breeding appropriately, such that it's still floating in the population, but we aren't producing affected individuals, which is fabulous. Over time, I expect the carrier rate to probably decline as well. But for the time being, that, that's not so much a concern as the genetically at risk rate. And then, of course, there's you know, non-DNA-based tests. So we can't test everything genetically. So we have to look at, at HIP scores through PEN-HIP or OFA, estimated breeding values, ophthalmic exams through SURF or what's now called um, CAER, heart exams, performance evaluations, confirmation evaluations, et cetera. And then you as the breeders get to take all of that information and put it together, health indicators, confirmation, temperament, as well as diversity, to come up with the appropriate um, um, mating combinations. And I like to, again, not necessarily think of um, putting your dog into this global database and just going, okay, well, tell me what the best genetic match is to my dog, but rather think of it in terms of three or four key dogs that you like all of the traits of you know, confirmation, temperament, health histories, et cetera, and then look at which one might be the best um, match and, and mate to your, your female or vice versa uh, so that you can really hone your program and work with the dogs that you are comfortable with and happy with. So a few online resources, um, mybreeddata.com in case uh, you wanted to look at the, the Labrador data or any other breed more uh, closely. Canine Inherited Disorders Database, the Canine uh, Health Information Center, Inherited Diseases in Dogs, and the Online Mendelian Inheritance in Animals websites are all great places to get more information. And then with that, I'm just going to say uh, acknowledge the, the folks that I work with here at Wisdom Health as well as the Genoscope team in Finland. Um, and actually they have just joined us, so we acquired um, the genetics arm of Genoscoper. And so my dog DNA that they have um, uh, been selling globally, as well as Optimal Selection, which we sell in the U.S. and Canada, has all merged under the Wisdom Health banner. Uh, and some of our research partners uh, that we work with every day. And finally, any questions? Uh, if you have an interest in Optimal Selection specifically, we have the website here. Um, and like I said, Optimal Selection and My Dog DNA are two halves of the same whole. So um, my dog DNA globally, optimal selection in North America, but it all fil filters into the same genetic database um, and online portal. So you have access to all the information there.
Great. Thank you, Dr. Hughes, for this fascinating presentation. It was fantastic. I heard this twice, and I, I love it. <laughs> so, uh, guys, again, thank you so much for all of you who attended tonight. Now we're going to, we are going to do a Q&A. So I know that on the chat we already flagged eight questions that we received during the webinar. If you have more questions, this is the time when you should post them on the, t on the chat. Uh, but, again, I want to... To thank again Dr. Yooks for participating, it was fantastic. Uh, if, uh, there's still one at 9 p.m., so uh, if you guys are friends and you enjoyed it, let them know because we, we are going to do another session in an hour. And uh, I'm going to stop the recording, and Dr. Yooks, the Q&A flow will be yours. <laughs>